Monday. That means solved or unsolved. And in this week's edition, we're going to be looking at the uh, the homicide of Martha Moxley. Now we uh, we looked at this case a few months ago, and I feel good about that assessment when I did it. But still, some things that bother me about the case. So for you that are unaware Martha Moxley was a 15 year old white female who was murdered October 30th 1975 um, in Greenwich Connecticut in an affluent section of a uh, of that town called Bellhaven so why is this solved or unsolved well there was an arrest and there was a conviction so you would say solved, right? Not so fast. There's still a lot of questions. And in fact, the person that was arrested, Michael Skakel, was, he was not arrested until I believe the year 2003 or something to that effect. Um, and he did about 11 years in jail before his conviction was overturned. And it was overturned for ineffective counsel, not because he was innocent. He eventually was granted a new trial. But the state felt, the prosecution felt that if there was a retrial, that they wouldn't be able to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's the prosecutor's own words there. So they decided not to retry him. And he, on October uh, 30th, you know, ironically, the same day that Martha was murdered many decades before, and on October 30th, 2020, he was uh, released from prison, and he remains free. Yeah. Maybe that's a good thing, because there's a lot of people that think he's innocent, including Bobby Kennedy, who is his cousin. Now, for somebody who kind of idolized uh, his father, or maybe his great grandfather, Robert Kennedy, um, in his conviction of taking down the mafia, to watch his son, and I believe it's his son, I don't believe it's his grandson, um, talk about how innocent. Michael Skakel is in these crimes is a little unsettling because what I realized by watching his interview and reading snippets of his book um, how fallible and how human these individuals are because they are put on a pedestal however they get up to that pedestal they're up there and just because they're up there that doesn't mean they're right Okay, they're humans just like us and we make mistakes. They make mistakes um, Sometimes They lie outright and sometimes we lie outright sometimes um, You try to twist the truth to make it fit your narrative I'm Seeing that a lot in this case But there's some things that that I want to look at even further than I did last time. 
I read the Sutton report. So what the Sutton report is, is that when this murder occurred, there were two suspects, three suspects right away. Michael Skakel, who was 15 years old at the time. Tommy uh, Skakel, who was 16, I believe, at the time. And their tutor, Ken Littleton. Suspicion had been upon those three pretty much from the onset. Now, Bobby Kennedy brought in some other suspects later on, which I'll get into in the deep dive. But Tommy and Michael basically were the main suspects, along with Ken Littleton. The Sutton Report was a private investigator firm hired by Tommy and Michael's dad. And he basically did that to get the spotlight off of Tommy. Tommy was the main suspect, not so much Michael. Michael was later on after this report so the Sutton report these private investigators and I believe they were former FBI maybe even behavioral health or behavioral uh, science unit members did a report and it basically pointed the finger at Michael and it so it sort of backfired on on the dad the dad hired them to find out who the real killer was because he didn't believe it was any of, you know, Tommy or Michael, not his boys. And it turned out that it pointed a finger more at Michael than Tommy. But they didn't absolve Tommy of this crime. So, after I read that report, which was phenomenal, by the way, It, it made a lot of things click for me. And it made me want to go back and maybe take another look at this case. And that's why we're doing this. So, there's some things that didn't, that, that just kind of, you know, like I tell you when you read police reports or something in your belly makes you don't, you know, don't, doesn't feel right. Ken Littleton is one of those. And I'll tell you what the major problem I have with it is that his post-offense behavior. So what is that, you ask? Well, you have pre-offense behavior. You have the offense, a murder happening, and then post-offense. So it's his actions and the way he conducts himself, his character, after the murders. Because a lot of times, people's demeanors will change. They'll move out of town. They'll start drinking more whatever if they didn't drink they'll drink now things like that will give you an indication that something traumatic happened in their life well ken littleton's post-offense behavior is troublesome he was a football coach at the time uh, of these murders and he had lived there as a live-in tutor and that was like his first day there Then Martha dies that day. Is that a coincidence? Well, I don't know. But I know in the subsequent years, Ken Littleton has become an alcoholic. He's been in and out of jail. Um, From what I understand, he has dabbled quite a bit in illegal narcotics. Something like that I don't like. Does it mean he's guilty? Absolutely not. But it's something as an investigator you got to follow up on. So that was one of the reasons that I wanted to look into this uh, once again. Martha had a journal that she kept. And I read through that. That gives you an insight into her mind. What this 15-year-old girl who was uh, described as very outgoing... Very flirtatious, but not promiscuous. Um, Everybody liked her. She was bubbly. Lots of friends. She was a transplant. What's that mean? Well, she didn't grow up there in Greenwich. She was from California and moved to that area about a year earlier. But 
she assimilated very quickly. So what does that, does that get us any closer to determining what happened? Well, yes, it does. When you read those journals, you find out, okay, not only how, how her mind works, but who she's hanging out with, who she's seeing, what they're doing. And there, there was a lot of Michael Skakel. There was a lot of Tommy Skakel in this journal. Other people as well. But Tommy made a lot of advances towards her. And a lot of them re were rebuffed by her. She was 15 year old. She was a virgin. She had not yet begun that um, venture into womanhood. But she was getting there. And that's what her journals tell me. But they also tell me of somebody that wasn't there yet and wasn't ready. I'm trying to figure out who these boys are and what they want. We're going to take a good look at the Skakels in that residence and how they were always left alone. They did whatever they wanted. All these kids in there, 19-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid, a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 8, a 9-year-old, all with no, no parental guidance. The mother had died. Uh, the father was often out of town, and he was out of town on this occasion. You have drinking, you have drug use, you have mischief, all that taking place on this very night. We're going to talk about the criminal profile, okay? What do I see when I look at that crime scene? Okay, the body, the weapon. Now, Martha was killed with a golf club. Martha was killed in her driveway probably around 10 o'clock at night and we'll get into more specifics on the deep dive uh, on Wednesday but what does that tell us okay is that a stranger is that somebody that is familiar with the area after Martha is killed she's drugged to an area that's a little bit more secluded what does that tell us does it tell us anything Again, the weapon being a golf club. That golf club was tied to the Skakel residence. Does that mean they're guilty right off the bat? No, it could have been left out in the yard and somebody grabbed it. But we have to look into it. What else do we have to look into? The state of dress of Martha. Was she sexually assaulted? The autopsy tells us no, she wasn't. But she was found with her jeans and her underwear pulled down. That tells us something, okay? And we're going to look at that. When you have a murder in an area where murders don't occur, oftentimes the police force are not equipped to handle such. Do I believe so in this case? Well, you're going to find out what I think about that. Also, I think it's very, very important to look at the 24 hours. And we can even narrow that down further than that. Look at the two hours before Martha was killed and her mom reported her missing. Look at the actions of her and her company and the location that they're at okay this will tell us a lot when it comes to the offender but we're going to get into that more just wanted to let you guys know that this is what we're going to be doing this week and this case is absolutely unsolved to me okay this is unsolved but I'm going to get into why I think I know who did this and the reasons why as we go further, I got to research a little bit more through the week here, but I'll tell you what I think because um, I'm very familiar with the case. And by Friday, we'll know who was responsible for the murder of Martha Moxley. And remember, we do this for Martha. We do this 
for Martha's family, her mother, Doris, her brother, John. We do it for all the other victims worldwide. And that's why we do this. That's why I do this. And this is why I'm passionate about this and having this platform to do this. Okay? So I will see you guys Tuesday for my key clue. And we'll go from there. So until then, mains out.